I'll go, I hate him. I hate him. Why do you hate him? He just interfered with my wife, he interfered with my kids. Right. 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 Take your Lenny McLean is a name that needs no introduction. A man mounting and self proclaimed governor of unlicensed boxing, McLean was one of the hardest men Britain has ever produced and a pioneer of bringing the unlicensed side of boxing and fighting to the mainstream. His three epic fights with Roy Pretty Boy Shaw are stuff of legends and still draw huge interest decades on. But there are also very dark, dangerous episodes in Lenny's life that were never first fully publicised. In Lenny's book, The Governor, he candidly talks about a lad, Billy Quinn, shooting him in the arse and orchestrating another attempt on his life where he was shot in the back. The gunman's real name was one Mad Barry Dalton, the Mad Irishman. And in this episode, we'll delve into the bloody feud in depth and give context to why the shooting took place, the aftermath of the feud, and the horrific circumstances that ended Barry Delton's life. Celebrity gangster books gripped the nation in the early 2000s when Bermondsey boy Dave Courtney brought his much hyped book, Stop the Ride, detailing his far fetching criminal exploits that had the tang of creative license to enthrall the reader, not privy to the realities of the underworld. A rare glimpse for straight goes into a world of gory violence and debauchery. That could be their secret pleasure without having to actually dip their toes into the unforgiving world. Then came along Lenny McLean's autobiography several years later with a front cover of his meanest snarl that would ensure thousands of copies would be sold and a legend was born, ingrained in people's hearts with stories of the physical abuse he suffered as a child to then the uprising of the governor of all fighting men on the cobbles and in the unlicensed ring. The sad fact this book was released after a shock bout of illness led to him being diagnosed with lung cancer and dying before its release added to the aura of the big man. But like all books of this genre, the publishers wanted to build a narrative of an unbeatable superhuman who was put on a pedestal to mythical levels. Lenny was a hard man, undoubtedly, but in the ring he was beatable, with losses to ex-pros like Cliff Fields and Johnny Waldron, also Roy Shaw in their first bout of three. On the street, he was also swimming in shark-infested waters, with many criminals involved in deep villainy who would think nothing of levelling up a confrontation with a shooter or a blade if he felt the odds were stacked against them in a fight. As tough as Lenny was, he wasn't a gangster or serious villain. He was an enforcer, doorman, hardman, who was an incredibly sharp businessman, who knew his capabilities and streetwise enough to tread careful amongst certain individuals. You don't go from being a celebrated hard man to appearing in TV shows, films and having best-selling books written about you without having a sharp brain that can see the angles. Unfortunately for Lenny, he did make a mistake when underestimating Barry Dalton, an up-and-coming prize fighter, originally from the mean streets of North Dublin, who had to move to the big smoke to search out his fortunes. To give some background to the little-known figure of Barry Dalton, outside of the London underworld and true crime circles, he was a volatile character who was involved in serious criminality. From protection to drug dealing, he was a figure that, although on the surface often played the fool, especially in the ring to hype up the crowds, had a darker side and was capable of serious violence. Not a figure you would put in the upper echelons of organised crime in London, but a dangerous figure never, nevertheless. The sparring session that would be one of Lenny's biggest mistakes is best described by Lou Yates, the hard man boxer and doorman, who was good friends with Barry. He said, At one stage, Barry was sparring with 22 stone Lenny McLean, who took things too far one day. What was essentially a training session ended up in a bloodbath, with Barry on the receiving end. Everybody was laughing as McLean smashed Barry around the ring. He even held him up rather than letting him go to the canvas, just so that he could punish him further. As Barry was helped to his feet, he saw that people, inspired by McLean's treatment, were ridiculing him, and he swore bloody revenge. Lenny talks about the situation in the book, calling Dalton by an alias Billy Quinn. He says, So off we go, and he stuck a few on me. I got him moving about, but I'm holding back because it's only a spar. After a bit, I said, Look, I'm going to have to slip a few in, let you know I'm here, or you might as well be on the bag. He said, All right, Len, away you go. I let him play around a bit more. Then had given him two in the derby, and he went over like a sack of shit. He jumped all up and red in the face and shouted, that's out of order. Lenny goes on to say he gripped Dalton in the changing rooms and gave him a talking to. 
To which account you wish to believe is up to you, the viewer. But I'm told by people in the know that Lenny did go over the top with Dalton and the book was pampering the situation to put Lenny in a good light. The reality is no one is going to shoot someone over a couple of digs in the ribs in a spar, in my opinion. I've heard other stories of Lenny going hard in sparring sessions with lesser sized men, but to define him as a bully would be a slightly harsh. Often with tough men from hard upbringings, their lived experiences could overspill into their treatment of others on occasion. But what defines a bully for me is someone who goes out and targets weaker people than themselves and shies away from confrontations with people they feel are too much for them. Lenny does not fit into that category, and I have heard countless stories of his generosity and help that he has given certain individuals. Regardless of the reasons, Barry Dalton felt humiliated and was not going to let their situation lie. He needed to save face and he knew he stood no chance in a straight go with the ferocious Lenny, so he decided to arm himself with an equaliser. Barry was no novice when it came to handling firearms, and had plenty of sources to acquire them as, as and when needed. Lenny talks in his book of opening the door to Dalton a few days, days later, and Barry trying to shoot him in the head but missing. Then as McLean shoots up the stairs to get a bat, fires a shot which hits him in the arse cheeks before Lenny chases him off with a bat. I would put this down to creative license from the writer Peter Gerrard, as I've been told Dalton knocked on the door and Lenny sensibly took one look at the shot he pointed at him and hot footed it up the stairs and took a load of lead pellets in his backside. Common sense would tell you if Dalton had aimed at Lenny's head from close range with a shotty due to the spray of the blast, it's very unlikely he would have missed completely. At any rate, Lenny survived the incident, but had issues with scar tissue and infections for some time after the incident. And as you could imagine, it would be unsettling to think a madman was walking around with the capabilities to shoot you on your doorstep. Dalton had saved face and took no time in telling people within the underworld that he had blasted Lenny in retaliation for the liberty in the sparring session and doubled down saying if Lenny attempted retribution, he would get the lead again. Lenny talks of another few of an East London firm at that time where had broken the jaw of one of their family members and they were hunting for re revenge also. During this time, Lenny claims he was shot in the back and a friend of his who had borrowed his car had his legs blown off in a case of mistaken identity. Unfortunately for Lenny, a man of his size, power and fighting ability meant that enemies would not bother with the niceties of a straight fight or even a mob beating. He was too much to handle and there was too much risk involved, so firepower was inevitably used. Lenny claims that Dalton, followed on, following on from the doorstep attack, had paid a man £200 to shoot Lenny to finish the job. But I'm told this was not the case by a reliable source. So whether this was creative license or not, um, it could have involved the other East London firm. I just couldn't tell you. I can't seem to find any records or verification of Lenny being shot in the back, although that doesn't mean it didn't happen. What we do know for sure is Dalton and McLean did meet again on the card Lenny fought my mountain York at Woodford's football stadium, but there's contrasting stories to what happened. Lenny claims in his book that he entered the dressing room and smashed Dalton's head against a metal locker, making him cry and plead for his life before shaking hands, squashing the beef and ordering Dalton from the grounds. I am told that Lenny did approach Dalton, but Dalton pulled a shooter out in the dressing room and threatened to end Lenny there and then if he didn't back off, and that was the prompt for McLean to drop the matter. Jimmy Holmes, in his book Judas Pig, claims that after the shooting, Lenny kept a low profile and did his training in South London, keeping away from the wild west of East London where Dalton was based. The inconsistencies in the book to other people's versions is understandable, as in a way a lot of these books from hard men at the time, or former gangsters, were written to settle scores or put their side across of events to save face. They would not have known how successful the books would prove to be and had no notion there would be platforms like YouTube and social media giving voices to people to analyse stories. Google was only launched in 1998 and YouTube didn't come along until 2004, so the internet was very much a new concept that did not take hold until much later down the line. McLean didn't have to lay low for long, as around a year later in 1992, Barry Dalton was found shot dead in his car, allegedly down to an Irish group he had messed up on a deal with, and a heavy East London firm. The murder is officially unsolved, but he was shot in the head at point-blank range as he sat at the wheel of his taxi cab. His murder was described as an execution-style killing. He was found by a passerby slumped in a pool of blood in the driver's seat of his Ford Granada car. Local residents say they recalled hearing two shots, however his post-mortem stated that he had only been shot once. 